Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Did you enjoy the session? <laughs> Thank you. I hope you're all excited about Clarice Connect as much as Giuliano and I am. So before we get started, we just wanted to have a rough sense of how many in this room interacted with HTTP, REST, JSON API? Wow. All right. Perfect. I just want to have a sense to, that's good. And have you been using any other um, integration tools per se? Which one? OK. So you know, we are going to um, get started. We'll make this interactive. We have a lot to cover. And then at the end of the, so first, we'll quickly go over a recap of our visionary keynote. Then we'll talk about why we have Clarice Connect, the business reason. We'll show you some of the features. We'll go over the demos. and how, and how do you manage and run flows, and then at the end, open up for Q&A. There is a mic there, and you know we encourage you to come there and ask questions. So we talked about this two-pronged strategy. The first is about the new capabilities that we're going to add on the FileMaker platform, and the second is our new products. And so for this session, we are focusing on the Clarice Connect. So why Clarice Connect? As we all know, the SaaS market is growing exponentially. And being a business owner, you will be focusing on your unique business problem. And we're not going to reinvent the wheel for, say, emails. Either you will be using Gmail or MailChimp or any of your email server, or for you know, marketing, or you will be using CRM for Salesforce and so many other apps. Which means now there is a need to integrate with different apps. And data is everywhere. And we live in the API economy. So how do we easily integrate these apps so that we can focus on our core business problem and automate business processes. And of course, as Giuliano and I were talking about the challenges, if you were to do this on your own, for each of the app you integrate with, you have to either write the custom code, even if you are using the data API, or you have to manage the authentication, authorization, then the monitoring, error handling. Now, we have now this powerful workflow automation tool that is actually handling all of this backend data infrastructures for you so that you can focus creating automating your business processes, and creating the next digital experiences. With that, I would like to reiterate what Clarice Connect is. Clarice Connect is an event-driven workflow integration platform as a service that automates repeatable tasks and business processes by connecting with third-party apps and services and FileMaker apps on cloud and on premise, with all the inbuilt functionalities and easy to use graphical interface, you can now create simple to complex workflows by simply stitching APIs together. Speaking about connecting to on prem, I want to show you how easy it is to connect to on prem. So, when you want to connect to on prem services, what we have is an agent that you would download. It is basically a proxy service that will connect your on-prem data to your cloud. It, can, it sits behind the firewall. It doesn't make a hole in the firewall. It uses the HTTPS port. And with that, you can easily connect to your on-prem data. And it's a Node.js implementation. We have 100 plus connectors. And we will keep growing will increase our footprint. And we, when we come out, and we will see that we'll come out with the connectors, but we'll keep increasing the number of connectors. 
With that, I would like to just go over the key features that we are going to cover today. I'll talk about, you saw a subset of the features that we talked in our visionary keynote, and this is like all the features that we're going to talk about, and Giuliano will cover in depth, but I'll go over, uh, over them. So you can connect, as I explained, any app on-premise or on cloud, and we have the agent to, con uh, to connect to your on-prem apps. And by the way, for FileMaker, if you want to connect to FileMaker, there will be FileMaker connector out of the box for on-prem as well as for the cloud. You can create workflows that require email approval, which means that a workflow you can wait for a human intervention. And then once you re receive the email approval, it can go and execute the rest of the flow. For example, if I want my expense to be approved by my finance, I can have the workflow wait and say, after I get the finance approved, I can then get and sync to the QuickBooks, for example. It supports versioning. It also has, uh, you can restore earlier versions. So it supports workflow versions. You can schedule your workflows. You can create event-driven workflows triggered in real time using webhooks. We'll talk about that more. You can extend the workflows with custom code using JavaScript. And then it's all built in cloud. It's a native cloud platform, so it is highly scalable. And then we'll show you how you can use some of the inbuilt utilities, like uh, calculations, math, text form formatting, as part of the transformation. Because what you're doing is you're extracting the data, doing the transformation, and then taking some action. And we'll talk about that more. So we have already seen this. Giuliano went over this. I'll just give you a, how easy it is within the workflow editor to create a flow or any step, right? So this is here where we are teaching the APIs basically together, just some simple steps. And it is really easy as one, two, three. We'll select the app. You select the action that you want to perform. And it can be like creating a record or updating or doing a search. And then you just configure the action. And that configuring of the action means either you enter user data or you grab the data from a previous step, which can be from another trig trigger or an action. So now let's talk about what's there inside the workflow editor. So inside the Clarice Connect editor, a workflow, we define it as a flow. So what is a flow? A flow is a trigger and one or more actions. That's what constitutes a flow, a business process. Now, what, have, what you see here is we have a form stack app, and on the other side, we have the MailChimp. Now, what we are doing is we are saying that every any time there is a new submission, new form submitted in form stack, we will create a subscriber in MailChimp. So my trigger is when something happens. That's the event. That's the trigger that will get fired. And that's how I will create a trigger saying, whenever there is a new form submitted, fire this trigger, and then take the do what? Take the action. Action is to add a subscriber on the other side. So that's what constitutes a trigger and an action. And you can have multiple actions, too. Does that sound good? So now let's see how do you define a trigger. Now, a trigger is an event that a flow will be listening to. And the trigger gets kicked off when that event has happened in the app. In this case, our trigger is when new form submitted. That's when the flow is going to listen to the third-party app, and whenever there is a new form submitted, it's going to extract the data. So we are now going to show you how to configure a trigger. So here is 
one of the pages of your workflow editor where you basically create the trigger. And this is a new flow. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to select the app. In this case, it's my form stack app. And now I'm doing a new form submission. So I'm going to authenticate the account using OAuth. Once I complete the authorization, I'm going to select the form which has already been predefined in the form stack, which is the DevCon form. I'm now going to go to form stack and actually submit a record, create the form submission. Why am I doing that? I'll explain. Once I do that, you come back to Claris Connect, and you save it, and your trigger is created. Now, what happened in this flow is basically, when I'm creating the trigger, I went out and create, did the form submission. So the trigger listened to that form submission, picked up the sample output payload. And we will going to show you that once I have this output payload as a sample, in the rest of the steps, when I create actions, I'm going to map data from this trigger to my action. So as you know, the event-driven architecture has evolved. It used to be polling, but now most of the connectors apps, they use webhooks. So Claris Connect leverages web webhooks to just sit and wait on an HTTP request for an HTTP request from the third party service to notify whenever something has modified. Why? Because the polling and webhooks accomplish the same result. However, with polling, there are a lot of other overheads. There's server overhead, and then there is also that you do not get the real-time data. For example, what you do in the polling is you do a get request, and they say, for example, a certain interval. Say every 12 hours you do are doing a polling. And when you do so, and you create an, the create an event in the endpoint, by the time you do the next poll, your data is already, your app data is already out of date. And I was reading this article that most of the other players, integration players, have also uh, kind of published that 98.5% of the time, the polls, polling is like failure. You don't get the data, real data. And then also the overhead. It really creates a huge overhead on the server, the compute resources, the bandwidth. So, we are now using the webhooks. Of course, there are some edge cases where you know, we, we can support polling too. The next step is creating the action. So we talked about the trigger. We selected the app, just to recap, selected the app. We did the authentication using OAuth. Then we selected the form, and we submitted the form, so we have the output payload. Now we are going to go ahead and create the action. So what is an action? An action is basically an operation that you will do on the third party app, which is like a create, or it can be an update, or an a search. And when you perform the action, you basically you are entering either user data, or you will take the data from the previous step, which is in this case, I, will, I already have the output, the payload request, and then I will take the data and map it to the action. And in most cases, it will give you back an output, return you some data. For example, if I'm creating an order as an action, it will give me back the order ID. In my last example in the visionary keynote, while well, I was looking for a, a customer type in Salesforce, so I'll get back what the type is. So I can do a search, I can do an update, but it'll give me back some data. So in this case, I'm doing is uh, creating a subscriber in my MailChimp. And for this demo, we have already created, there's already a subscriber list that exists in MailChimp, which is called DevCon Demo. And now I'm going to go ahead and create this action.
Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. So this is also shows you that what actually happens is one of the documentation that so we are just doing a post in the MailChimp. So this just shows that the method that's being used as an action, you're just doing a post there. Now let's take a look of as I was talking about, you will actually create a you will create or update. And in this case, as you can see, it is filling in the details and we'll show you in the demo from the previous step, the email, which we got captured as part of the trigger when we ran the trigger and submitted the form. Now here is the demo. So we already have the trigger. Now I'm going to go ahead and create an action. I'm going to go ahead and select the app, which is my MailChimp, and now I'm subscribing to a list. I'll go and authenticate, go for the authentication of an account using OAuth. So I log into MailChimp. And now I'm going to select my DEF CON demo, which is the subscriber list, which was already created. And now all I'm doing is mapping of the data. So I, from the step one, as you can see, from the trigger that I already had, I had the output. Now I'm mapping my first name to first name in MailChimp. I'm mapping my last name, email. So all I'm doing is mapping of the data. Once I do that, I save the action. And then you will see later that when you turn this flow on, every time that the trigger is created, that the event happens on the app, it will go ahead and execute this flow and create the record, or in this case, create a subscriber, add a subscriber to the list in MailChimp. So what I just explained was the data mapping. So step data, as you can see on the right, is basically your data mapping. And these are the steps, list of steps that you can perform. So all I'm doing here, as you could see, is you are taking the output from a previous trigger or an action and mapping it to this action here. So in this case, I took the, that's the step data. So in action, as I mentioned before, either it could be user input data or you could grab the data from a previous trigger or an action and map it there. And that's what the step data is. Now, Claris Connect supports multiple authorization protocols, like OAuth 1, OAuth 2.0, custom uh, auth, and so on. And in some cases, you know, if the connectors do not support OAuth and they have user ID or the password credentials, we also uh, take that, but we ensure that they are all secured, all third-party account credentials are secured, and we use AWS KMS for the security. With that, I'll pass it on to Giuliano to show you a flow and integration with FileMaker. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks, Angita. Yeah, so I'll, I'll take it from there, and we'll show how we can continue growing the flow, now adding one more step that connects actually to, to FileMaker. Uh, before doing that, a quick overview of what the FileMaker connector is capable to do at the moment uh, to give an idea of what's possible, right? On the trigger side, as Sangeeta mentioned, you, you might have different uh, philosophies on how you can connect to a third party and list it for new data or list it for an event. Um, the, the best way, we believe, is to now make this available. It leverage the powerful scripts that can, you can run based on any kind of interaction you believe is meaningful for your user on your FileMaker app, and you send a notification that can trigger a flow anytime. When you run this script, you basically are pinging an URL that we automatically generate for you. It's going to be unique for your project for that flow. And you know that by pinging the URL, you pass the data and the additional context that you want to be used to run your workflow, and it will take it from there. Pretty much as you've seen earlier with the example that Sangeeta was doing, the form stack was sending a sample pail of data, of the actual data that's been typed into the form. 
with your FileMaker project, when you do that call, you basically can you know, put in the body of the request whatever you think is relevant for your workflow, and that will be available as data that you can then map to any other field on the following step of your workflow. On the action side, we allows you to work with all, of course, all the records uh, across your app and to run a script uh, as well remotely. Oh, there is a resolution clicker here. All right. Um, and to run also script when required. And now, you, you might be thinking from what you've seen before, right? When it comes to the action, what Shingi to show you with MailChimp, it was you select what action you want to perform, but then you have a set of fields, right? A set field that you need to fill in. And that field are nothing but the parameters that that API is waiting as an input to in, in, able, in order to kind of execute that successfully. But the problem is that with, you know, with most SaaS out there, they are pretty standard data model. But with FileMaker, that's definitely not the case. Each app is custom and tailor-made for your use case. You have different data models. But what we've been able to do, and we're actually able to do also with other services that support this, we leverage Metadata API. With Metadata API, it means that when you give us the database that you want to connect to and the layout that is related to that action that you're going to configure, our platform automatically looks into that layout and dynamically generate for you the field reflecting your layout, right? So this will be different every time you connect to a different app because it will be basically automatically tailor-made for your use case, for your app to fit the actual action you're configuring. And as you can see, this basically will be automatically generated. And I'll show you in a second. And it will be mapping all the fields that are there, like uh, the guest name, the, the status name, email, all the fields. This is basically retrieved in real time. And then we preserve the data mapping so that behind the scenes, where you need to do that API request on your behalf when a workflow run, we know how, where each kind of value of that parameter should be placed in your FileMaker app. Right? So let, let's see that in action. So we'll take it from the two steps that has been created previously while Singita walked you through the beginning of this flow. And now we're going to create a new record. So the process will still be the same. We're going to chain a new action to the process. If, OK. We're going to select the action that we want to perform. And first of all, we need to start from the building block, right? Create record is the action. We're going to connect new account. In this case, we're going to provide you know, uh, credentials, basically, for an, a user account that is able to interact with the data API of that project. As we continue, the first two fields that we require to ask is which database, which layout are we interacting with? And you will see that as soon as we finish to fill in the name of the layout, what happened now is an API call has been done to that FileMaker server. We got the data, the well, data model, and we can start doing the mapping once again. You can even chain those uh, step data together. You can really think of us as placeholders or variables, but they're going to be filled in real time with the actual context of the, work, of the workflow as it's being executed. And it's pretty much that easy, as it looks like. Right? So I'll now finish the you know, pairing all the data and doing the data mapping, filling each one of them, and I can save it. In the end result of that, is that now when you fill in the form, as soon as you submit, the data gets there. And of course, it's also on MailChimp. And it takes literally a few seconds because we integrated the workflow using the, the webhook uh, capability of Stamply. This, there, there is, of course, an existing script on the FileMaker side that, well, um, script that could notify data if we want to collect data from there. But here, it just got basically, we're just hitting the API. As soon as we get the notification from FormStack, we call MailChimp, then we call FileMaker, your app, and it's, it's there, right? <laughs> All right, so now we've seen pretty kind of very simple use cases, but there's a more stuff that you can do with a flow is not necessarily linear, like just one step after the other one. Singita anticipated during the keynote that you can have if-then-else logic in your flow. So your flow can have different paths and follow uh, different steps and execute actually different steps based on the condition that, that you say, right? Let's say that you have something like form stack. 
you get an email address, and maybe you want to distinguish and treat differently corporate email addresses from a personal one. You can have easy kind of condition that says, I don't know, if the email field, and again, you're going to use the data mapping capability, ends with at gmail.com, that's most likely a personal um, email address. If it's at claris.com, it's going to be obviously probably a business lead. And by doing so, you can treat them in a different way and build your workflow with more, com with more articulated business logic. And some of the relevant building blocks here that we provide out of the box is scheduling, another one that was mentioned. This is basically mostly used as an alternative trigger, right? Not necessarily your flow. You will want to run your flows when something happens on a third party, but maybe some of these just need to happen uh, any specific kind of time interval. And with this one, you can go from very simple configuration, like it's every hour of what day, if it, whether it's weekdays or not. You can take it up to more advanced kind of timing with being able to pass in basically a cron notation as you do with batch processes that are configuring in your, in your Linux shell or, or Mac terminal, right? It's basically a cron tap notation. So you can take it from very easy configuration to very advanced one. We, we always try to find the right balance between making it super easy for you to go fast when it's needed to avoid to reinvent the wheel, but still, we don't want to abstract away too many of the complexity, or that would mean that you cannot go do more very complex stuff. So we want still to give you power whenever it's needed to go deeper into the logic of your flow, right? Then it comes to built-in apps. So what are built-in apps? Built-in apps allows you to perform specific operation on your data that sometimes needs to be transported or massaged somehow when it needs to go from A to B. Uh, an easy example could be data formatting. You know, dates across different services are not uh, always handle, actually almost never handle with the same uh, format. And by doing so, you're going to have utilities to work with dates and change data formatting, or maybe do differences or add to dates. So you can you know, calculate new ones. You're going to have mathematical operation in case you need to you know, sum or do some other mathematical function there. You have text utilities to do anything from transforming the case to generate a base64 encoding, generating random password, uh, splitting strings on specific characters. So it's, it's a basically a, a Swiss knife toolkit for your data, right? So mathematic data extraction from document, utilities that extract data from images, like EXIF data. So maybe if a picture is coming through the flow, you can figure out what device was being used to shut the picture, what resolution has the picture, what it has been shot if he has geolocation data tied to it. So there's a lot of cool things that you can do, a lot of stuff that we didn't want you to go outside and find for a third party for, for really kind of atomic and simple operations like that. So we basically already made it available and baked into the product so that you can use it right away. And you can also do conversions, right, for file types? Yeah, fi file conversion is one of the other uh, yeah. possibilities, right? Yeah, maybe a PDF, you want to have to be transforming a PNG or vice versa. You, there's a lot of cool things that you can do there. Uh, approvals is another one. So we mostly see in use case now, right now, that we're basically machine-to-machine uh, -machine somehow, right? Just third-party service and API interacting with each other. But we, always, we, we also had the possibility for you to add some human interaction in the flow execution. And it is all, often the case with approval processes. What approval does that at some point in your workflow, you can say that Someone will need to be involved. So let's say Sangeeta will need to approve this. The slide is ni nice enough. Right? <laughs> and what happens is that basically can configure the step and that says, OK, the approver is going to be Sangeeta. And I'll, can, I'll be able to provide uh, an e her email address because it, they, she will receive that notification as an email. And the email will say, hey, the workflow is running. The description can be fully customized. And she just kind of two simple links, yes or no, so it can sort of lazy approval. And as soon as she does it, the workflow picks up from there and continues the executions, right? So in, in there are cases where you want to add human judgment, a human interaction, you can also do that. Then I received this question out there uh, from some of you, like, what if the third party that I need is not available right away? Well, there are multiple solutions to this. Let's call it problem. Uh, the first one, I want to make sure, I want to tell you that Building a new connector with the integration engine that it has is really 
uh, one say effortless, but it really takes to us as well that provide the, the Lego building blocks there a fraction of the time to cover a new connector. But even if it's not there and you need to use it right away, there are different ways to kind of to cover this sort of shortcoming or temporary shortcoming, which is one of them is, again, Webhooks. Webhooks is a component, it's a generic one that allows you to do two things. It can be used either to, as a trigger or as an action. When it comes into the form of an action, it's pretty much a REST HTTP client. You, it would require a little bit more configuration, as you can see, right? Because you need to provide what's the ultimate URL that you need to ping. Uh, it is going to be kind of a JSON payload. It's going to be a post to get a put or patch request. Uh, what are the headers of that, of this HTTP call? What are the authentication that's going to? So it requires a little bit more configuration, but, it's, but it's, again, it's super flexible. If you have a custom app, maybe it's, maybe it's not even a FileMaker app, but it still has a REST API, and of course, we cannot have a built-in connector for that because we wouldn't even be aware that, that the app exists, you will not be prevented to involve that in your workflow because this, still, this component will help you with that, and vice versa. If you want to create triggers, well, actually trigger flows from a custom app or any other app that you want, the webhook is also can be used to generate custom URL for your project. And again, you just throw a bunch of data to it with an HTTP request, and you can execute the flow from there. Mm -hmm. If you want to go even more deeper, we have code blocks. Code block is a full-fledged Node.js environment that we run in a purely serverless fashion for you. It's, it's really like a place where you can write your custom server-side logic. This can be run as a, either a standalone API that will be run by us in a, you know, an isolated container that we spin up in real time to provide full security and isolation from anyone else in the platform. And we can just leverage that to enrich your application without even bothering about hosting that code somewhere. Or this can become, for the reason that it exposes an API, one more step of your workflow, right? So let's say that before passing the data to FileMaker earlier, we just wanted to do some more fancy transformation. And maybe the built-in utilities might be even not enough, or they would take too many atomic simple steps to get there. 10 lines of code will always be more powerful than that, right? And, some, and most of you, I'm expecting, that will be able to master that very easily, which means that one step in your workflow is, okay, grab this data and run this piece of code with me, well, for me, and it will spit out the result that you want, and you take it from there. You just really leverage this as any other API of a third-party service that is available out there. It kind of this closes right now the, all the building block that you have. But then you have your workflow app running right, at some point. So the toolkit that we provide you allows you to, A, monitor all the executions. right? So you can check in any time what has been executed, what has been successful, when it's been run, what failed. And what you could do is also, oops, pardon me, bad build here. You can ex inspect for each single execution that you've seen before. You click on that, and you have a similar representation to, uh, of the flow that you had in the flow authoring experience. But each step of the workflow will show you uh, the request and the response that has been done to that. So even if the flow is successful, sometimes maybe the end result might not be the one that you expect. There might be an edge case that you didn't kind of uh, uh, think about when you designed the flow. And the best way to realize that maybe there is some data mapping that is not being configured properly is by just you know, look at that execution and see what it was the value for each single attribute of this API request and what was passed to the action that followed so you can very easily sort out what went wrong there. When, when you work with Flow, what we also do, this one of the things that it, Sangeet anticipated earlier, we keep track of the version of your Flow. Think of it as a lightweight version of a Git, you know, like GitHub or versioning system built in on the platform. So if you, you know, every time you change a configuration of a step, you add or remove a step or anything, uh, any type of edit, we kind of able to figure out what you changed there, as you can see from the description. And any time, you can just time travel to a previous version of a workflow in case you screwed up something by mistake or just want to come back there. 
you just click on the version that you want to restore. That will become the new current version, and you'll take it from there. Uh, last but not least, and pretty cool feature, uh, it's fault tolerancy. Now, when it comes to, the, to interact with the big guys like know, the Box or the Salesforce, it, it's very unlikely that their service would be not available, right? The, the SLA of the average SaaS platform out there is very high. But when it comes to custom application, there is so many factors in place that can work against you, which could be even just network latency or temporary outages, right? So what the platform can do is provide some sort of insurance on your, on your workflow, right? We do allow, when, when you have setting in place, what we do is that if the workflow is running and we get a response that is an error, the, let us assume that it's not something that is our fault, like you know, bad request with bad credential. No matter how many times I'm going to retry that, it's always going to fail. But some server-side error, let's say internal server error or connection timeout, may be due to a temporary outage. So with fault tolerancy, what we do is that we're not going to drop your workflow execution. We're just going to wait a few minutes and again retry. We're going to have an exponential backup strategy to do this over the next 10 to 12 hours, right? So we would, we'll do multiple attempts before really dropping the execution of the workflow. And in case it's a temporary outage or just a matter of a network latency, you're covered. And I think that from that standpoint, it's kind of, this is our someday added. There are a lot of details that we could dive into. Uh, but I would like to kind of start going to the closing remarks so we can have as much time as possible for, for questions. Thanks. And you know, one of the things we might still want to highlight is security infrastructure. Um, as for cloud as well, as we've seen before, we take, in, we take security very seriously. Mm -hmm. So all your data will be encrypted at rest. We're not going to persist the data uh, because we, we're basically a, a pass right? We're real middleware for you, and everything will be secure with the best practices and hosted in, in AWS with their powerful key management system for encryption. Uh, from an infrastructure resiliency standpoint, the platform is designed strongly microservices, microservice architecture oriented, which means that it's very elastic and we can module, well, actually the platform automatically scales based on the workload. So it's always size you know, big enough to guarantee performance of all of you and if there is any sort of peak of traffic due to unexpected condition, the platform will adjust and know what needs to be scaled and replicate processes to, you know, to guarantee that nothing goes wrong there. And just to add to that, as uh, Giuliano mentioned, it's just a pass-through. There is no persistent data. However, there are logs so that you can debug uh, if anything goes wrong. So we have the log retention. Yep. And you want to, oops, sorry, back click. You want to yes. cover this? So as I said earlier that we are planning to launch this in the Q1 2020. And you know, we'll come out with the first set of connectors. Number one, we'll keep growing our library. We will have then in the roadmap the extension with the custom code. We will have integration with iOS and the Siri uh, shortcuts integration that we showed earlier. We will have the on-premise support. We'll also have on-premise support with the agent and so that you can easily connect with your on-prem apps. And as I mentioned earlier, you will have out of the box FileMaker on-prem connector and also FileMaker on cloud connector. We'll do have uh, team collaboration so that when you are uh, creating the workflow, you can actually are building the workflow. You can invite your team members to come and work with you on that workflow. So there will be team collaboration. And then we are also planning to come up with the connector kit so that if you see that it's more like that SDK. So if you see there is the connector that does not meet your requirement, this will help you to build the connector for your business need. So we will have that on the roadmap too. Yeah, so for those that are still eager to learn more about APIs and Clarice Connect, there are two follow-up ses follow sessions that I strongly recommend. Now, Chris Ippolite will speak at 1.30 p.m. in 
that room, uh, and it will show some uh, cool demo leveraging FileMaker and other third-party service that you don't want to miss. And same for Mike Berge's session that comes right after that in this room. Uh, so if you want to keep learn more and see more of Claris Connect in action, uh, that's definitely the place where you want to be later today. Uh, I think that as an overview, we're, we're done. And, but I would really, I, I'm sure there are questions out there. So please don't be shy. And, and I would like to just add one other point, is this will be available as a separate product. So it, if you have requirements just to connect different apps which does not involve, say, FileMaker, you can still use this. Questions? All right, you can. I think there is. Some of you can walk to the mic. It's, it will be enabled right away. Thank you. There was something you just, will the uh, Claris Connect work with uh, solutions, FileMaker solutions, when they're hosted on third-party servers? As long as that it, the, the API is reachable. OK, well, there's just something about she said about on-premises and, and cloud, so I wasn't sure if those guys were being excluded or not. No. no. OK, OK. It'll work. Uh, and then I noticed a distinct lack of Microsoft logos on your, um, I, I know this is all a marketing event, but is it reasonable to assume that the Office 365 suite will be yes. available next Absolutely. year? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, it's built to be an open platform. With anything that would be relevant for you from a business standpoint will be there. Regarding uh, error handling, you, you can have different sort of flavors of failure. You could have an availability issue, or you could have a record locking issue, or perhaps a user removed a field that you're mapping to from the layout. And so that would be a fatal error, I would think. And I was just curious if there were any way to sort of uh, manage the if else. That, that's a good question. Like that. So there is an additional piece that you can add on, on steps that are potentially keen to that type of error. What you can do, you can add an error handler, like a try-catch statement, sort of like that. And by, by doing so, you will be able to handle that exception as pretty much with the same way you could do. We, you've seen that before with if-then-else logic. So after your step that might be error-prone or error-sensitive, you can have that one so that if it fails, you can have a, some sort of backup strategy or even just have an additional step that alerts you and on some channel where you, well, you will p decide the kind of the strategy that you will prefer to handle that error, but it's definitely there. Uh, you can have one, each, for each one step of your workflow, you can design an error handler just right for that step. Does it answer your question? Good. All right, two questions. Uh, can you pause the flow, like say you're going to do a uh, server upgrade and it's going to take an extended time. Can you pause the flow so that it still queues up all the incoming triggers? And then when you re-enable it, it just runs them all? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, right now, that's not available. Flows can be turned on and off. Uh, but that's definitely a good, very good input to, okay. to think about. Yeah. And a second question was, if a flow, um, if it, uh, air happens and it exhausts all five tries and it just gives up, and you see, can you um, Read the read the debug log and then go and replay that flow after you made the corrections. Yes. Yeah. What happened is that when you zoom in into the specific execution that failed, you're going to have actually a, literally a replay button. When you when you do that, uh, the platform will pretend that the trigger just happened. So we use exact that's the same exact payload that triggered the flow at that point in time, and we re-execute the current representation of the flow. So you. Whether it is you figure out that there was an error and you want to rerun the flow and so that it runs successfully, or there was a temporary outage and you don't want to miss that still, you can just go there, hit replay, and we will pretend that that just happened, and we rerun your workflow again. Are there any plans to have an on-premise version of Claris Connect itself for customers who either have intranet-only uh, services that they need to uh, integrate or have policies about no uh, business data being outside of their, of their systems? Not at the moment. No. It's purely cloud-based. It's a multi-tenancy engine designed to scale. And that's not something that we, we plan right now. 
Uh, and what about just other non-FileMaker on-premise services uh, using the web, Claris mm -hmm. Connect? Uh, will the agent that's going to be present on the FileMaker servers be able to connect to those? Yeah. Or yes. do they need their own agents? Okay. No, 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 no. That, there's, there's no problem with that. As long as even if it's an on-prem service, expose an interface to internet via API, the, the agent will be able to cover that. The agent is really a bridge between the two worlds without asking anybody to open an, an incoming door, uh, an additional door on your firewall for incoming traffic. So, uh, but everything else will just be covered. And we will be publishing also on-prem connectors for other, um, besides FileMaker, the other apps on-prem. Yeah, hi, speaking of connectors, I, I've been switching back and forth between different sessions, so I apologize if this has been already covered. But uh, in, on the topic of connectors, is it, you mentioned it would be possible for us to write our own for APIs that are not mm -hmm. currently offered by uh, Connect. Um, is, is it also going to be possible for there to be potentially a marketplace for, for those connectors? Yeah, that is the goal, but in the near future, near term, that's not we are planning. This is just the near term roadmap that you saw, but that's something we are thinking about. Okay, thank you. Hi. Uh, can you tell us anything at all about the pricing model, whether it's per <laughs> request or? I want I mean, to clap it, too. I know it's probably not locked down, but like anything, no. is it, even if it's like, it'll be. In, uh, it, it's, it's under discussion, so there is anything that I can get yeah. this close yet. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be uh, uh, kind of proper. So any data point I would give you might, might prove me wrong like in, in a few months. I don't want to give you wrong data. Uh, it, will, it will be communicated as soon as possible, but it's. it's yeah, so uh, we are working on it. And uh, to be honest, when we go back, we'll actually go and work on that. Piece. And so right now, we don't have uh, any data. OK. All right. Well, we do already accept credit cards, if you want. We can hold that here when you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I have a question about a specific use case. Uh, so at my work, I wrote a uh, Python API with Django, and it triggers, uh, so whenever it's, it's for an air monitor, so whenever it's a certain value depends on what uh, API it uses or what call it does. And so how specific can the triggers get? And also, can I set those triggers to be input off of another API? Uh not sure if I get a question. Um, but so like when an API, so like uh, with the air monitor, when the particulate matter is above uh, nine, let's just say the value nine, it needs to trigger go into this call. It mm -hmm. needs to do a specific different call. And also with the custom code versus uh, the connector workplace, how easy will it be to uh, connect with those apps there and with a custom API? Yeah, so that the, the general purpose building block that was mentioned before, either code blocks or webhooks, sounds like they're already a, a well-designed solution for your use case. Because again, you, you, no matter what you know, underlying language you read, as long as the REST API, you in, and you're able to either make an outgoing HTTP request to an endpoint that will hit the flow, and then the rest of the logic can be taken care of there, or vice versa, there is something that happens on, on your workflow, you want to notify your services, uh, it's just kind of a couple of configuration away. The webhook built-in block that I showed you earlier will allow you to configure the URL and the payload that you want to customize, and you'll be all set. All right, and also, uh, what's the scalability looking like? Uh, like, will it be able to do 14,000 records, and how long do you expect that to take? So if I'm trying to send data with uh, a, a field from each record, mm -hmm. um, how long do you expect for like something like 10,000 or 20,000 records to take? Well, it, that really, that's really bound to network latency most of the time, not really about the platform. It, it depends on how the most step your workflow has, the most APIs needs to happen, or HTTP requests needs to happen, and they come with a minimum latency. And depending on the service we're working with, that might be different. Again, if you're working with Box, they have data centers pretty much all across the globe, so the latency might be relatively small. If you're working with custom app that are only hosted, in one region, uh, that might be a different conversation. So there's no kind of a fixed number that I can give you there because it really depends from the building blocks that you're leveraging and how long is the entire flow. Uh, but I can tell you, though, that there is no cap on the number of steps that you can put in a workflow. It can be up to 80 steps. There's no problem. But of course, they will come with a you know, longer time of execution, as you can imagine. OK, thank you. You're welcome.
Hi. So uh, I have two questions. First one, uh, what HTTP verbs are supported? Uh, so, so you can say it again? Which HTTP verbs are supported? Like put? All of them. Like ISO all. Post. Well, all of them, we heard uh, that uh, FileMaker will support, support all HTTP verbs, but for by now it only supports post and uh, put barely. Yeah, but that's on the FileMaker uh, data yes. API side. Well, that's on, our, on, on the Clarity, what, what I can sp we can speak for the Clarity Connect side. Uh, it, the, the meter that you've seen there from creating record, updating them, deleting, they're automatically implicit to say that we support all the HTTP verbs. So pretty much all crude mm -hmm. implementation. Yeah, and you're, they're also available in general purpose one. So again, okay. with, with a bad book one, you should select what type of HTTP request you want to do, and the fields that you will be shown after that will match what actually is possible. For like if you say like it's a get HTTP request, you won't have a body field because there's no body. It will be yeah. just URL parameters. OK, and the second one, uh, which uh, Node version will be used? Which? Like mm, Node.js versions? We'll always kind of target the latest stable version. Okay. You're talking about the, the code blocks, I yes. imagine, right? Yeah. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, will Claris Connect have its own API so that we could script uh, like the creation of flows and that type of thing? Mm. Uh, it's, uh, it's not there yet, uh, but we, we know that it could be a, a strong value add in case you don't want to go for the UI configuration. You might, might want to deploy flows. Uh, so we're, we're definitely evaluating that. We have that in mind. We'll, we'll just The more feedback you, we collect about a use case, yeah. the, the better it will be for us to shape that feature. Thank you. You're welcome. Um. First, I would like to say grazie. Thank Prego. you very much. Uh, I'm really excited about uh, this other service platform, whatever you, however we're going to call it. But so I'm really excited. Okay. Um, is there two questions? One, is there a payload limit size? So could we send a really large payload? How large? Like, how, how, is that capped out at some size? And um, Would, sorry, finish what you. Okay. And then the other question is, um, are there any kind of uh, callback capabilities. So like I wanna I wanna do something where I fire off a workflow and then um, and then sit dormant or idle and, and get mm -hmm. called back to do something else or somehow um, you know um, that those two things. Sure. So first question uh, payload cap with JSON not we don't really need it. It's unlikely you're gonna have like ten megabytes of mm -hmm. JSON text there. Um, with with files that but something that we might uh, evaluate and again, will something that we're now fine tuning. On the callback stuff, uh, it's there actually. Uh, we didn't get some dive into details of each single checkbox that you can flag on a product, but each flow comes with a callback URL that allows you to receive the full representation of the context of execution of the flow step by step with all the uh, request and response data that's been executed to a custom URL. So even if for let's say you have all you know. Uh, analytics platform where you want to collect all this data and, pr and look at it after that, or you want to preserve your own story, history, and logging of your flow, you can do that. You just give us a custom URL when the flow finishes execution, we just send everything to you and you, you do whatever you want with that data. So at a high level, this seems similar to some services that are out there like IFTTT and Zapier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, just curious how you compare and contrast what you're offering sure. to those existing services. So IFTTT, I, I mean, it's, it's very close as a overall concept, but it's really kind of consumer-ish okay. product. It just can do like two-step, no more than that. And it's like, you know, I take a picture on Instagram, put it on my Dropbox, pretty much there. Zapier is definitely closer, uh, but we consider this like a Zapier on steroids, if, if you wish. Uh, the things that you can do with the logic of the workflow, you cannot do that with now with Zapier. The header rendering capability are definitely not there with Zapier. Uh, custom coding environment is not there. On-prem support is neither there. Uh, so yeah, really think that this is designed for more proper use case, not very kind of simple road hacker sort of automation, if that. It yeah, to add to that, Zapier only handles very simple kind of workflows. This can really handle w complex workflows, and Zapier is only uh, cloud services only, not a hybrid model. A uh, couple of quick questions. Uh, so, 
Uh, we're talking about FileMaker scripts being executed. Would we expect then uh, any parameters would have to be formatted as JSON? Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So what? For FileMaker script mm -hmm. execution with any parameters that are included, would we be expecting them in JSON format? Is that the only way they would When you use it as an action, like at yep. some point you want to run a script, yeah, this JSON, REST JSON is now the, the format that we use. For the parameters? Yep. Yeah. OK, cool. Uh, second thing, uh, when we're talking about workflow, um, in terms of batch processing or reporting, are we really thinking then we're going back to other tools to, to get that information, that workflow is really just single actions kind of thing? So we do have that on the future roadmap. Okay. So that's there. Currently, it doesn't support the batch integration, but that's in the roadmap in the long term. OK, thanks for that. So security is built in. Will you sign a BAA for HIPAA clients? Sorry? Will you, will you be offering to sign a BAA for HIPAA clients who need that level of compliance? You mean for like the health industry? Uh, yes. Not in the near short term, but it's under discussion. Not in the near short term. Not in the near short term? I mean, near term, we discussion. don't have it. So not at launch? Not at launch. No, not. Okay. So off limits for healthcare, FERPA. Mm -hmm. And GDPR, any concerns around that? No, GDPR is covered. So you'll sign a data processing agreement with clients who need that? Yeah, we do comply, as we were talking about, we do comply with the uh, GDPR regulations. So I'm not talking about regulations. I'm talking about signing a data processing agreement for those industries that need it to register you as a third-party data processor. Yeah, that will be mm -hmm. taken care of. We, we, this is going to be available worldwide, so yeah. whatever okay. is going to be the regulation, yeah. we, we need to deal with the process that needs to be done. To, so GDPR to will be available, HIPAA is on the roadmap. Hmm? So you said GDPR compliance will be available, but HIPAA is on the roadmap. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Welcome. Uh, hi. Do you uh, anticipate you'll be able to integrate with something like Amazon Web Services for uh, purchases and like uh, Walmart Marketplace, those kind of things? Well, I mean, any API can be part of our hmm. platform, and the way we're going to build it will be strongly customer-driven. So the more we figure out use case, the more we can add them. And in the meantime, again, we will provide the necessary toolkit for you to cover any shortcoming with an API integration that you might need. Okay, but so as long as that third-party service is an API, we can do that. Um, you just well, need to we, let we, us some know. Of the, some of the reason I say that is because they have quite strict uh, you know, throttling requests. Uh, mm -hmm. Things like that. If you over, go, if you go past your limit of requests, then they're going to stop you, and you got to be able to catch that information. And mm -hmm. uh, same with like with Walmart, it's a multi-factor authentication where you have to do some pretty complex things to to build a request. Things like that. And so, that will it encapsulate all those kinds of things? Sure. I guess. Now, the underlying integration engine allows us to do pretty fancy things with mm -hmm. when it comes to custom type of authentication processes that are not kind of standard OAuth. Um, so that, that's definitely something we can cover. Uh, there might be edge cases that we might find out that cannot be covered right away. But our job is to kind of you know, allows you to don't even care about all these integration challenges. And we'll keep growing that as soon as we, I mean, in the, for what I can tell from the, also the past experience, mm -hmm. we, be keeping, we kept improving the in integration engine as, as long as we kept finding new use case and bumping into different flavors of uh, web book implementation, all out, or all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there anything that's going to allow, like if a record gets created in FileMaker or modified or something like that, like a webhook from FileMaker side of thing just automatically happens without having to do a script insert from URL or something like that to initiate it? Yeah, that, that falls more on the FileMaker side yeah. than on ours. Uh, I, we believe that definitely as we move we forward, I mean, this is going to be more and more unified as an experience. That's mm -hmm. where, we want, where we're headed. Um, so don't, don't hold me on that. But we will definitely make this yeah. as much seamless as possible. Uh, right. On the Clarice Connect side, we can do all this stuff already. Um, on the FileMaker one, I'm sure that there will be effort to, yes. to make that more easy to do. And we are trying to make this like a unified platform. So yes, we, that's a very good feedback. And we will get into it. All right, thanks. All right, well, it's 12 p.m. sharp. Thanks for taking Thank the time you. for the questions. We'll be, we'll be.